greatest NBA team of all time. A team built to win is what he said. Like, if he wanted to make a team that was built for winning basketball, this would be the lineup that he would make. So we're going to go and dive right into this list. So he starts off by saying, when constructing the greatest NBA team of all time, the challenge is finding players whose unique skills complement each other for maximum efficiency and success. My selection of the following five players not only highlights individual greatness, but it also creates a harmonious blend of size, defense, scoring, playmaking, and unselfishness. This team is built to beat any five-man lineup in NBA history because of their synergy and balance. So that's his, that's where he started out. So at point guard, we got Magic Johnson. Now, I personally wouldn't put Magic Johnson on the list simply because I'd already have LeBron on my top five, like in the in the lineup and in the starting lineup. But his reasoning for Magic is Magic Johnson is widely regarded as the greatest point guard for good reason. His combination of size, basketball IQ, playmaking ability makes him ideal. Makes him ideal, like as a playmaker. He was a five-time champion, um, three-time MVP, averaged 11 assists per game over his career. His vision on the court allowed him to make passes others couldn't see, which kept defenses constantly guessing. Why not Curry? While Curry is the greatest shooter, Magic's size and defense give him an edge. I respectfully disagree with the defense. Magic Johnson was actually a little bit of an overrated defender. The only reason why people consider him a good a good defender is because of two things. One, NBA 2K. They juice up a lot of the stats. That's one, but I'm sure that's not the reasoning why. And two, like the reasoning for my boss is why, um, as to why he claims his defense. And two, his height. Like, a lot of people, they think that because, you know, Magic Johnson was so tall, like, oh, he can get blocks. He didn't really get that many blocks as, um, as a tall six foot nine point guard, despite having a huge size advantage against all of the other small guards at the time. And when you look at him guarding the ball, he was just a cone. I'm sorry. He was a cone on defense. And sure, he got a lot of steals and led to a lot of fast break opportunities. But you also have to remember that the basketball IQ from a lot of players back in the day was not the same as it is right now. You aren't going to see many players make such predictable, easy passes for Magic Johnson to pick off. And on top of that, again, Magic is just not as good of a defender as a lot of people like to make him out to be. So really, I would actually would rather have Curry in there. And his defense is not much better than Magic, but his offense is like you can make the argument that it completely exceeds magic and it would fit better under a lebron led offense with the system that you know running around screens and actually getting wide open three-point shots because so far i think one big problem with this lineup i'm skimming through it is that three-point shooting is going to be an issue so that was his reasoning for not picking curry i respectfully disagree and b another point says um that he has is magic was a proven playoff performer winning championships with elite passing and leadership. I do agree with that. He definitely is a much more, a much better playoff performer than Steph Curry in most situations. But still, on, a, on an all-time team like this, I mean, I just wouldn't give Curry the ball. And again, I'd give it to LeBron or several other options that I have on the team. So next, at shooting guard, he has LeBron. Now, LeBron can play any position, so I have no problem with him being a shooting guard. But why LeBron? He says that James may not be traditionally listed as a shooting guard, but his adaptability allows him to excel at virtually any position. LeBron is the NBA's all-time leading scorer, an elite facilitator, boasting career averages of 27 points, 7 assists, 7 rebounds. His size, strength, and athleticism enable him to dominate both ends of the court. LeBron's ability to play off the ball and set up teammates gives this team an added layer of flexibility. His combination of scoring, playmaking, and defensive ability makes him one of the best, com most complete players in NBA history. Yes, LeBron should be on this roster. Why not MJ or Kobe? While Kobe and MJ were elite scorers, their reputation for demanding the ball and occasionally clashing with teammates may disrupt team chemistry. LeBron, on the other hand, has been known for his unselfish play, improving those around him and keeping teammates engaged. And to that comment, I agree with it with Michael, but I disagree with it with Kobe. Because you have to, this is, if we're looking at the prime, like we're looking at the prime years of Kobe, those were when he ended up winning the, you can make the argument that his prime was when he was on the Olympic team. A team that was known for having, being surrounded by fantastic players. And 
players that shared a similar work ethic with Kobe. Like, you can see it on the Redeem Team documentary. When Kobe, when people found out that Kobe was in the gym at 3 o'clock in the morning, D. Wade, LeBron, Bosh, and everybody else except for Carmelo Anthony were all on his schedule. But to be fair, Carmelo Anthony was such a good Olympian athlete. He did not need to be on Kobe's schedule. But still, all of those players, they followed in the footsteps of Kobe and... When Kobe sees that you have the same passion and dedication for the game, he is going to he's going to give you that respect because the reasoning for why Kobe was labeled as a ball hog was because he wouldn't give the ball to his teammates because he felt that his teammates did not take the game nearly as seriously as he did. Like he saw them in practice. He saw them fooling around. He saw them not getting as many shots up as him. And he just knew that they weren't made out of the same stuff. So I respectfully disagree with my boss's opinion on Kobe Bryant and that reputation because Kobe discarded that reputation once he joined the Olympic team and showed that he can play with a fantastic supporting cast and be the leader that the team needed. Granted, he was also able to show that he can play alongside another alpha like LeBron James. So I somewhat disagree with Kobe not being in the lineup, but we're going to continue on with this list. And... Drew Pau Gasol is back in the chat. What's up, Pau Gasol? I'm just going to call you Pau Gasol just because, you know, I it's it's a lot easier to say. And at the small forward, this is very, very, very interesting. He has Dennis Rodman at the small forward. And, yeah, I don't know if I really got to say much about that. Now, his reasoning for this is because he's the ultimate team player. While not traditionally small forward, his unique skill set makes him perfect for this lineup. Rodman is widely regarded as one of the greatest rebounders and defenders in NBA history, averaging an incredible 13 rebounds per game during his career. Even through, he was often matched up against larger players. His defensive versatility allows him to guard multiple positions, from guards to centers, and he was known for shutting down some of the league's best scorers. Rodman never demanded the ball, which means more touches for the scorers on the team like Durant and LeBron, and spoilers, Durant's at the power forward, and his rebounding prowess providing second chance opportunities and preventing fast breaks for opponents. I'm sort of curious as to why he didn't put Kevin Durant at the small forward and then Dennis Rodman at the power forward, but then again, it's really positionless, so you can put them at anywhere, and then they'll be fine. LeBron or Magic are still going to be the ones bringing up the ball in this lineup, so I guess, but at the same time, Rodman should be listed at the power forward and Kevin Durant should be listed at the small forward, if anything. But that's just me if you're going to continue with this lineup. And I do understand, you know, the whole role player and things like that, but I don't know. I mean, Dennis Rodman, like, you also have to remember all the off-court shenanigans that he does and how there are times where he's probably not even going to be at games because he's busy in Vegas or something like that. Like, probably marrying a planet or something like that. And I do understand, you know, yes, like, Rodman, fantastic role player, but... Still, we're acting like all these all-time talents can't be role players or don't even want to be role players. Like, when you make a lineup that is full of the greatest players, the greatest players are going to understand how good the other players are. And they're not going to even challenge that. And if they need to take a step back, they know what it takes to win the game. All-time great players will know what they need to do, and they'll know what it takes to win the game. And if you and like you know, the argument for Kobe was that you know Kobe wants and demands the ball and all that things. But if Kobe is winning without the ball, I don't think he'd have a problem with it at all. Like the reason why he constantly wanted the ball was because the team wasn't winning whenever everyone else was getting the ball. So he was like, give me the ball, I'm gonna win the game. Like, that was the reasoning for it. There's legitimacy to Kobe's ball hogging. And it's not like um, Kelsey Mitchell and her ball hogging, but that's a completely different story, good lord. Next on the power forward is Kevin Durant. Why Kevin Durant? Durant is arguably the most complete offensive player in NBA history. Standing at 6'10 with a 7'5 wingspan, Durant is nearly unguardable. His career averages of 27 points, 7 rebounds, and 4 assists per game showcase his ability to score from anywhere on the floor, whether it's in paint, mid-range, or beyond the arc. Durant's size and shooting ability make him a perfect fit for this team, as he can space the floor and create his own shot in isolation. 
Additionally, Durant's improved defense, especially during his time with the Golden State Warriors, makes him a two-way player capable of guarding power forwards and wings alike. I respectfully disagree with the Durant. Yes, he was a good defender on the Golden State Warriors, and like you know, he was arguably that was arguably the best defensive years that he had. The reason why he was so good at the defense in Golden State was mainly because there was less of him to do on the offensive side of the ball. So you might make the argue, you could actually make an argument that um, Kevin Durant would be an even better defender with all of these, you know, scoring, with, with a scoring roster, because then he could focus on defense as opposed to primarily saving his energy for offense. You could make that argument for Kevin Durant. Next, why Durant over other power forwards? Well, players like Tim Duncan and, um, I'm not going to mention the other guy's name because I really don't want to, I can't stand him. We're just going to use Tim Duncan because let's face it, he's the only one that really has a legitimate argument for power forward. While, player, while a player like Tim Duncan might be considered more of the power forward spot, Durant's shooting ability and overall offensive versatility gives him the edge. He complements the rebounding and defense of Rodman and the center on the lineup, which is Bill Russell. And Gasol in the chat saying, I don't know why they don't update Durant's height. And... That's a thing that a lot of teams do. They, um, you know, actually, there's actually somebody in um, our college basketball team right now where the coaches actually listed her as a little bit taller than what she actually is. And, you know, they're just completely fine with it. It's something that they do. It's something that a lot of sports teams do to try and get that edge. And, I mean, they're probably not going to update Kevin Durant's height because, you know, we don't really have legitimate proof that he is um, seven feet tall, even though I have no doubt in my mind that he is seven feet tall. But that's a completely different story. That's the reason why they don't really want to reveal that. So next is Bill Russell at center. Why Bill Russell? Well, he said the, the reasoning for Bill Russell is because he's the greatest winner in NBA history with 11 championships in 13 seasons. Respectfully disagree on that. He was aided by a very talented Boston Celtics team full of Hall of Fame caliber players. Hello, John Ablicek. Not really John Ablicek, but you know. The um, Bob Cousy, excuse me. But yes, like these, his team was just so much better than every other team. And yes, he did contribute a lot to the team being great, but... Don't forget the rest of the Hall of Famers on that Boston Celtics roster. His defensive dominance and leadership are legendary, and he redefined what it means to be a center. He averaged 22 rebounds and 15 points per game for his career, and his defense anchored the Boston Celtics dynasty of the 1960s. He was an unselfish player, always focused on doing whatever was necessary to win. Russell's elite rim protection and rebounding would allow this team to thrive defensively, and his leadership and willingness to sacrifice personal stats for team success make him an individual piece. Why not other centers like Shaq or Kareem? While Shaq and Kareem were dominant offensively, Russell's defense, rebounding, and unselfish play are better fits for this team. His ability to guard the paint and ignite fast breaks with outlet passes perfectly complements the fast-paced, versatile style of this team. And quite frankly... Big problem with this team is spacing. And I'm going to, like, this is really a bad team in terms of spacing. They have a power forward that can't shoot and then a center who doesn't shoot and played in an era where there was no three-point line. This is really, really bad spacing. And I don't really think that having bad spacing is going to benefit anybody. Now, defensively, I mean, you know, they, you can make the argument that Rodman would still be able to keep up with a lot of the the guards and um, defense and, you know, staying in front of the three-point shooters, but still, like, I mean, he also doesn't really score, so he has to pray that he holds his opponents to zero points every single game, and in an era where a lot of people are going to have a lineup that shoots a lot of three-pointers, chance, it's like, chances are some of those contested shots are going to go in, and obviously, you know, you can make the argument that they won't go in, or that, you know, some of them, they might end up missing more than they make, but still, like spacing is a very very important factor in my opinion especially when constructing a team now he also gives reasons to why he feels like this team works unselfishness the lineup features players who are known for making their teammates better with magic lebron and russell 
being the elite playmakers, Rodman doesn't need the ball, and Durant is a perfect off-ball scorer. Yes, I, that, that makes total sense, sure, but pairing up Magic with LeBron is a little bit... I don't know about that. I mean, sure, LeBron can focus on being a dominant scorer like he usually... Like he can be, yes, but I feel like that will also mitigate a lot of aspects to his game because if LeBron is trying to drive to the basket, there's going to be help defense coming in. The only option for him to kick out to in that instance is Kevin Durant. And chances are there's going to be somebody in the paint because Dennis Rodman is going to be there and Bill Russell is going to be there. So it completely negates a whole aspect of LeBron James's game where he is most efficient and most dominant at. I don't think that's going to work. And like it's really going to be it's going to be a difficulty like adjusting that because of all the attention that LeBron already demands in the paint the lack of spacing is only going to make it worse now defensive versatility that I can make an arc that I can agree with aside from Magic Johnson every player in the entire roster on this lineup is has the ability to play defense without a doubt they do have the ability to play defense and there there's really like no real defensive mismatch except maybe at the point guard spot. But again, you can make an argument that that's not really going to happen. But, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Magic Johnson's defense. He was a really bad defender. Rebound, well, not a really bad, but not like as good of a defender as people make out to be. Now, rebounding. With Bill Russell, Rodman, and LeBron, this team would dominate the boards. Russell and Rodman are among the greatest rebounders ever, and LeBron has consistently been an excellent rebounder for his position. Yeah, sure, rebounding, yes, but you got to put the ball in the basket. And... That's sort of, like, you're going to get defensive rebounds all the time. And, I mean, you can make the argument that, like, you know, offensive rebounding is going to be a little bit easier, sure, and that could wear down the defenses, but how much is that going to wear down your offense, too? I am not entirely sure about that. Offensive efficiency. Magic and LeBron would facilitate the offense, creating open shots for Durant, while Rodman and Russell clean up missed shots for second-chance points. So, essentially... This lineup is begging to play a five on three, which makes zero sense to me. I'm sorry to say this, but it's like, no, this don't work. Magic is going to have to kick out to LeBron for an open three. And yes, LeBron can shoot, but what happens if LeBron wants to kick out for an open three to Magic? It's not going to work as, as well. It's just not going to. And this is if you're going to make a lineup like this, you should put Steph Curry in this lineup because Steph Curry has the gravity and he has the attention brought by defenders. He's going to get double team on pick and rolls a lot of times. And that would also open up a lot of space inside of the paint for LeBron and for Bill Russell and Dennis Rodman to get a bucket. Now, Dennis Rodman's definitely not going to try and get a bucket, but at least Bill Russell is going to be able to get a bucket. Now, in conclusion, this team, Magic, LeBron, Dennis, Kevin Durant, Bill Russell, is built to win because they complement each other in all facets of the game. And no, I do not agree with that whatsoever. I think you can construct a much better lineup than that lineup. Again, my lineup of my lineup, my all-time lineup is Steph Curry at the one actually not even, like LeBron at the one, Steph Curry at the two, and then Kawhi Leonard at the three. Kevin Durant at the four, and finally, either Tim Duncan or Shaq at the five. You can intermingle, and you can switch whichever one you want. It doesn't matter. That team is going to win every single game. They have enough spacing. They have enough versatility. They also have um, a group of... Actually, you can even substitute out Steph Curry for Kobe Bryant on that list, but I would much rather have somebody like Steph Curry on the roster, and... Again, it's a really weird lineup, like, you know, having Kawhi Leonard on there and not somebody like Kobe Bryant, but I do like Kawhi Leonard's defense. He did win Defensive Player of the Year award at one point, and while Kobe does also have defense, I do think that Kawhi Leonard is a little bit more, wouldn't have as much issues with the team as Kobe might have. But again, I wouldn't mind putting Kobe in that small forward either, but I would actually much rather have a lineup constructed like that, where there is no Michael Jordan and where there is no um, Kobe Bryant and where there's just hyper-efficient scoring because Steph Curry takes very high percentage shots. So does LeBron. Kawhi Leonard and Kevin Durant, one of the some of the most efficient mid-range shooters in the entire history of basketball. And 
Yes, Michael Jordan was a very efficient mid-range shooter, but the big difference maker between Kawhi and KD and Michael Jordan is that they have a developed three-point shot, which also complements the way that the NBA is played right now. So we spent a lot of time on this segment. I did say this was going to be a much longer segment than usual. So we're going to go ahead and go into the final segment where I just talk about a three-team trade. Um, which could send Brandon Ingram over to the Golden State Warriors. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that right after this short break. Be sure to stay tuned.